Chapter 4, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to what we did in Chapter 3, and we're going to extend it to what we call solutions. So before we start, um, first of all, the reason I'm on this slide is because this thing messed up somehow. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> uh, so there's one other slide before this that we didn't get to see. Uh, but anyway, so as always, these lecture notes are primarily taken from Brown and LeMay's chemistry text. Um, and also from Zumdahl's chemistry text. And then the commentary, as always, is provided by myself, Dr. Goodwin from uh, Houston Community College. And so, as I was saying, in Chapter 3, we looked at what a mole is, and we decided that that was, like, for example, for hydrogen. If we uh, have hydrogen, it has a mass of one atomic mass unit, uh, where we define the atomic mass unit in terms of grams, and also what we are thinking it is to be, uh, like, a conceptually and then we defined a mole as how much or how many hydrogen atoms for example it would take to make the equivalent number of grams as it is in terms of atomic mass units for its its uh, mass as far as an atom in other words uh, for hydrogen for example or let's actually change it let's say for carbon 12 uh, it weighs 12 atomic mass units <clears throat> six protons, six neutrons, 12 atomic mass units. Uh, so how many of those would you have to have if you wanted to have 12 grams? And we decided that we didn't decide this, but they showed this experimentally that it's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. All right, so that's one mole. So what we're gonna do now in this chapter, uh, and it's not difficult, is we're just gonna translate that over to solutions. So when we talk about solutions, what we mean is when you take like, uh, for example, if you take a teaspoon of salt and dissolve it in a glass of water. Um, so uh, if you dissolve the salt in the water, you have yourself a solution. And uh, the basic definition that we're going to look at in this class is going to be something called molarity, which is just telling you how many moles there are of that salt in one liter of water. So if you had one glass of water, you wouldn't have... Uh, well, and if it was a big glass, you might have a whole liter, but probably not. Uh, so uh, you would have to uh, extend the volume of the water to the point where you had uh, actually the solution until you had a, a liter of it. Uh, so you'd have to just do a little calculation. The way you do that, well, there's two ways you can do it at least. Uh, one way is that you can use the ratio in proportion but the easier way and the quicker way is just to divide how many moles of whatever it is you have by liters of solution. So the uh, actually, let's go on to the next slide because I'm getting ahead. Uh, so next slide. Uh, and let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So and next. All right. So um, let's stop here. All right. So let's forget about the definition of molarity. We'll get back to that in a moment. So. Uh, water here is shown over here on the right hand side and this is H2O, uh, one oxygen which is shown here in the red, uh, and then two hydrogens. Uh, the reason that those uh, little things with the plus signs and minus signs are shown here is because uh, water is what we call polar and we'll come back to this again and again throughout the semester. Uh, and what we mean by that is that the O and the H here like for example right here, don't draw electrons the same. The O's actually have more of an attraction for the electrons that are between the O. Remember this is a covalent bond because it's between two non-metals. So we have sharing of electrons, not one taking an electron completely away from the other one, but we just have sharing. But even when we have sharing, we can still have uh, unequal sharing. And in this case, it's unequal sharing. Uh, the O has a stronger attraction for those two electrons between the O and the H here. And that happens on the other bond also. It's the same. So the O tends to become what we call partially negative. So it isn't a full negative. And anyway, we're not doing that in this chapter, so we'll come back to that. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So when you have a solution, we were talking about the salt water. The salt that you put in there would be considered to be the solute. And so usually uh, it's pretty easy to tell that when you have a solid and a liquid. The solid's usually going to be the solute. Uh, the liquid would be the solvent. So the difference is just in the into those two names. And the whole thing is called a solution. 
the whole thing is called a solution. If you have two liquids, usually you would say that the one that's present in the lower quantity would be the solute and vice versa. And then, uh, so what we have here is uh, the definitions for solutions. So a solution is like salt water or it could be sugar water or anything where you're dissolving something in like water and it doesn't have to be a solid and liquid. It could be two gases, two liquids, uh, or it could be a solid and a liquid or it could be a gas and a liquid and so forth. Um, and then most of the time they're aqueous and what that means is that it's in water. Almost all of what we're going to do in general chemistry the whole year is going to be an aqueous situation. It won't be where you're dissolving something. Usually it won't be where you're dissolving something in something else other than water, although there will be some examples, but most of the time it's going to be aqueous. And then at the bottom, we're just kind of introducing the term electrolytes. So like, for example, uh, if you did dissolve this salt, the NaCl in water, uh, you'd have uh, in the water, the NaCl will break up uh, because the water will do what's called solvating it. It will break it up into the Na pluses and the Cl minuses. So you have charged particles floating around in the water and that's called an electrolyte or electrolytes. The sodiums pluses and the chlor the sodium pluses and the chloride minuses. Uh, so we're just introducing that right now. Next slide. <clears throat> so when you have <clears throat> something like uh, a very soluble salt like sodium chloride is and you won't understand that until you get to 1412 but a soluble salt basically is something that breaks up a whole lot when you put it in water now not all salts do that and that's the, the uh, topic of chapter 17b in 1412 so uh, we don't want to get into that too much right now but uh, sodium chloride is one of the salts and how many salts are there? Gosh, there must be hundreds of them. But uh, there are some of them that won't break up very much if you put them in water. But sodium chloride will break up. And uh, my fan just died again here. I can't believe this because I just charged it. So evidently it must not have charged. Either that or it's just gone kaput. Oh, that's too bad because it's really hot out here where I'm recording this. Uh, anyway, so what this slide is saying is that uh, when you put something like sodium chloride in water, it's considered to be a strong electrolyte. So I'm going to have to turn on my alternate fan. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Uh, it's just unbelievably hot out here in my kitchen. Um, also, we just want to mention this now, and we'll come back to it later, mostly in 1412. Uh, strong acids like hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid, or strong bases like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, will completely uh, break up if you put them in water, and so they're considered to be strong electrolytes. When you put something like vinegar in water, vinegar is basically acetic acid, and that's a weak acid. Uh, so it doesn't break up completely. In fact, it barely breaks up at all. So that's considered to be a weak electrolyte, which I'm now circling at the bottom here. Next slide. And then things that you put into water that don't break up or that don't produce any kind of ions are called non-electrolytes. And to go back to our example of sugar water, if you put sugar or any kind of sugar like glucose or sucrose or anything in water, it won't break up, and the reason is because sucrose and glucose are covalent compounds, that, and they don't break up if you put them in water. So if you put those in water, you don't have any conduction of electricity because you don't have anything breaking up into plus particles and minus particles. Okay, next slide. Uh, here's some more stuff about electrolytic pro properties, so you can read this if you want uh, at your leisure. Next slide. <clears throat> Same thing here. Next slide. All right, and neutralization reactions. Uh, so remember last chapter we were talking about different things like decomposition reactions. So we're going to talk about some different kinds this chapter. Uh, when you have an acid in a base reaction, and it's, that's usually actually the way it's called, it's usually called an acid-base reaction, and we'll talk more about that later in this chapter. Uh, you have a neutralization, and what that means is that the acid properties of the acid are donated to the base and the base properties of the base are donated to the acid and you wind up with water. So water is actually 
what you get when you add an acid to a base. And the part that's left over, like here, we're adding hydrochloric acid, that's HCl, hydrochloric acid, and sodium hydroxide. Remember, OH minus is hydroxide. So the Na plus and the Cl minus end up being just kind of like spectator ions. They don't really get involved in the reaction. And the H plus off of HCl and the OH minus off the NaOH will come together to make water. So this is called neutralization because you're neutralizing, neutralizing the acid in the base. Next slide. Um, all right, let's go on to the next slide. I should have probably pulled that other one out. Uh, so anyway, we're back now to what I was talking about a moment ago. So molarity <coughs> is uh, the number of moles of solute. So for example, if you put salt in water, it would be how many moles of sodium chloride do you have? So you would have to divide how much you have of the sodium chloride. Like if you had 20 grams of it and you put it in a liter of water, then you divide how much you have of the sodium chloride by the sodium chloride's molar mass, which is 23 plus 35. Uh, 0.5, which that's what 58.5. So you divide 20 by 58.5, and that's going to whatever you get from that's going to give you the number of moles of solute of NaCl. <clears throat> and then you, if you had one liter, then you would just divide it by one liter, and that would be what it is. So I mean, just off the top of my head, that's about I don't know. Let's just say a third or 35. So let's just say um, 0.35 moles in one liter would be 0.35 molar in that case that I just gave you. Now down at the bottom here they actually give you an example. They say what would you have and just ignore this over here for a moment. If you had six moles of HCl dissolved in two liters of solution what would the molarity be? So you just divide six by two here. Just divide six by two and you would get three. So your answer would be three moles per liter which is uh, abbreviated as uh, mol or it's called molarity, and it's abbreviated with just a capital M. Now, it has to be a capital M. Uh, we're not going to talk about molality in this class, but in 1412, we will if you take 1412. So, um, molality is a different thing. It has a different definition, and it has an abbreviation that's also M, but it's a lowercase m. So, you want to remember to make it a capital M. So, capital M stands for molarity. Next slide. So here's an example you can do. 500 grams potassium phosphate dissolved in enough water to make 1.5 liters of solution. I'll tell you how to do this and then it'll be uh, given to you on the next slide how to, how to actually do it in terms of the numbers. So let me just tell you how to do this and then I'll let you do it on your own because it's a good exercise. So what you want to do is you want to get the mass for potassium phosphate. So you'll have to remember the formula for phosphate. It's PO43 minus. PO4, 3 minus. So you want 4 times O's mass <coughs> plus phosphorus's mass. <coughs> and then you want 3 times potassium's mass because it's going to be K3PO4. K3 because you've got a 3 minus on the phosphate and potassium is only plus 1. So you'll have to have 3 times whatever the mass of potassium is here. Um, so look at the chart, find the mass of potassium. I recommend you just pause it here and do that before you go to the next slide. And then whatever you get when you add all of these together over here will be the molar mass for potassium phosphate. So then divide how much you have, which is just 500 grams, by what the molar mass is of potassium phosphate. Uh, so it's, I mean, I'm just going to guess here, okay? I think maybe something like... Uh, three moles when you divide the 500 by the mass of potassium phosphate. Uh, I have no idea if that's right. I may be, let me just think about this for a second. Somewhere, let's just say somewhere between three and five moles. And then what you do is when you figure out how many moles there are of the potassium phosphate, then you divide it by 1.5. So that would be somewhere between two and three molar. Let's go to the next slide. Well, okay, it's actually a little less than what I said. So the mass here, mass is actually bigger than I thought it was going to be. I couldn't remember potassium. Anyway, so when you add this together, you get 212. So I'll let you look at this on your own uh, because, as I said, it is a good exercise. So let's go to the next slide. All right, um, here's another example. Uh, if you have calcium chloride, then as we said, if you put something like this in water, an ionic compound will break up, a covalent compound will not break up. 
So if you put calcium chloride in water, it's going to break up into the various particles that are in there. One calcium and two chlorides. Uh, so if you start off with a concentration when you add uh, the formula unit here, calcium chloride, to the water, you've weighed it out so, or masked it out so that you have uh, 0.25 molar for the whole thing. Then when you put it in water and it breaks up, for every one of these calcium chloride formula units that you put into the water, you're going to produce one of the calciums. So the concentration here of the calcium will also be 0.25 molar because there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the whole formula unit and the calciums. Every time one whole formula unit breaks up, it produces one calcium. But for the chlorides, look, there's a difference there, right? Because every time one formula unit breaks up for the calcium chloride, it doesn't produce just one chloride, it produces two. So the chlorides are going to be twice as concentrated as the CaCl2 was when you first put it in the water. So it's going to be two times 0.25 molar, which is 0.5 molar. And so what we're doing here is we're putting these uh, out in terms of the molarity that they already had. So we don't have to divide anything. They already told us what the molarity was. So all we have to do is just figure out the relationship here between the CaCl2 as opposed to the Ca and the Cl's. Let's go to the next slide. What, so <clears throat> this is another one that I'm going to let you guys do as an exercise. But what you're going to want to do here is we, we're trying to find out which one of these has the greatest number of ions. So what we'll want to do is, first of all, convert all of these things over here on the left column to liters by moving the decimal over three places to the left. Or you can divide by 1,000 or multiply by 1 over 1,000 or whatever you want to do. But we want to convert milliliters to liters. And there's 1,000 milliliters in a liter. So we want to use our conversion factor uh, to convert uh, from milliliters to liters because when we're multiplying these by the molarities, which I'll explain that in just a moment, we're going to have moles per liter. So we want the units to cancel. So if we put these in, I mean, and you can actually do it the other way, but I don't. I, it's easier for me to see it, and I think for most of my students to see it if we just convert that to liters. Uh, and then, so we would have, for example, here an A, 0.1 moles per liter times 0.4 liters, and the liters will cancel. So you'd have 0.1 times 0.4, which is 0.04 moles. So when you multiply moles per liter here, this M is moles per liter, and when you multiply that by liters, the liters cancel, and you get moles. So what you would do is you would do that for all four of these. Just, first of all, move the decimal over three places, or divide by a thousand, or whatever and then multiply by whatever the molarities are, but the molarities are all the same. But anyway, so find out, first of all, how many moles do I have of NaCl here for A? Same thing for B, C, and D. How many moles do I have? But you're not finished then because you want to then multiply it a second time by how many particles this thing is going to break up into when you put it in water. <clears throat> so let's do those together. NaCl is going to break up into Na plus and Cl minus, so that's 2. So you multiply by 2. CaCl2 here will break up into three particles, Ca2 plus and two Cl minuses. So you would multiply the, whatever number of moles you have by 3. Uh, and then for FeCl3, it would be four particles, one Fe3 plus and three Cl minuses. The sucrose won't break up at all because it's covalent, so it will just be one. So whatever you get for your number of moles here will just be multiplied by one, so that one won't change. So um, let's go to the next slide. And it turns out that number three here was the one that, uh, let's see, that was... Um, Part answer choice B, calcium chloride, you started off with 0.1 uh, moles per liter, 0.1 molar, and uh, you had 300 milliliters, which we converted to 0.3 liters. You multiplied that out to get the number of moles, and then you multiply it by 3 because the CaCl2 breaks up into 3 particles. So you multiply by this 3 here, and when you do all of that, you get 0.09 moles of ions. Uh, for the NaCl, you got 0.08. Uh, and also you get that for FeCl3 here, 0.08. And you also got that for the sucrose. So the one that has the highest number is this one right here. Next slide. So uh, I just put a note here that 
uh, the one that had the greatest number of ions is not necessarily the one in which uh, either the volume or the molarity is the largest. You have to do all three things. They all have to be taken into account. Okay, next slide. All right, so here's your main formula for this chapter, so you'll want to commit this to memory. I think it is on your formula sheet, but you, it, it's just so easy. Just memorize it. <clears throat> so it's M1V1 equals M2V2, where you're talking about when you're diluting something, which I'll come back to that in a minute. So here at the bottom, M1V1 equals M2V2. Uh, so what that means is the molarity of the before times the volume of before equals the molarity of the after times the volume of the after. So um, what I mean by before and after is like if you had, let's say, a glass of water that was three molar and you diluted it by adding another liter of water. I mean, you'd have to be a big glass, right? Uh, then you're, when you do a dilution, what you're doing is you're just adding water. So, but the concentration is going to go down. So uh, the three molar, if you had one liter at three molar, so you've got one liter of water and you've got, let's say, NaCl in it, and NaCl is three molar, and you add another liter of water, <clears throat> then the three times the one has to equal uh, some number x, some unknown number x times two. So in that case, it's going to be 1.5. But I mean, so let's go to the next slide. So you'll want to uh, remember that M1V1 equals M2V2 because you're going to use that kind of a lot. Uh, also, you'll need to remember it for the final. So we have a 0.5 molar solution of sodium chloride, and it's in an open beaker. Uh, which of the following would decrease the concentration? And uh, so we've got four or five different choices here. Um, so let's take a moment here uh, and go through these. So A, add water to the solution would decrease the concentration. So there's our answer. A is our answer. If you add water to it, it's going to decrease the concentration, make it more dilute. B, if you pour some of the solution down the sink drain, it won't change the concentration. It just gets rid of some of it. C, if you add more sodium chloride, it will increase the concentration of the sodium chloride. If you let it sit out in the open air for a couple of days, some of the water will evaporate just by natural processes. If you leave it out for a couple of days, it may all evaporate. And so anyway, that's going to increase the concentration. And E is off the table here. So none of these from B to E are correct. So the answer is going to be A. Next slide. What is the volume of two molar NaOH needed to make 150 milliliters of 0.8 molar? So this is M1V1 equals M2V2. So this is your M2V2 here, 0.15 liters. So I'm going to convert that to 0.15 liters. And I have 0.8 moles per liter. So I just multiply those together. So 0.15 times 0.8 is going to equal some unknown number, which is going to be the volume here. We can call it V or X times 2. So let's go to the next slide and look at the answer. So use M1V1 equals M2V2, uh, where 2 times, I just left it as V here, equals 0.8 moles per liter times 0.15 liters. Uh, if you're wondering why I have this extra zero, it's because they had an extra zero here. So I just kept it consistent. <clears throat> okay, uh, and so you uh, divide both sides. You multiply this times this, and then divide both sides of the equation by two, uh, as we said before, and you get as an answer that this first volume is going to be 0 0.06 liters or 60 milliliters. Next slide. Okay, so let's go back to types of reactions and see if we can find some more next. So um, we talked about some different things last chapter, like uh, decomposition, composition, and, and so forth. Uh, but there are, it turns out, uh, at least three major types of reactions, and that's what we're going to talk about in this chapter. So there's uh, the maybe the one that we're going to talk about the most is precipitation reactions. Uh, we'll also talk just a little bit about acid-base reactions and a little bit about redox reactions. Let's go to the next slide. So precipitation reactions, we're going to focus on mostly this chapter. Uh, they're also called double displacement or metathesis reactions, 
where what happens is that you react to things that are both just solutions like salt water and what happens is when you react them um, uh, well you've got the salts broken up in each one of the solutions and they're just floating around but then one of the salts from one of the solutions will bump into one of the other salts uh, components from the other solution and they'll stick together and precipitate out that with they'll stay together and fall out of the solution which is what we call making a precipitate uh, so let's go to the next slide and here's an example of that <clears throat> so we have here sodium chloride which is soluble and silver nitrate which is also soluble but when we mix them together uh, and I'm at the very top of the slide here if you take the AG plus and put it with the CL minus it turns out that when they uh, like bump together they'll stick together and they'll fall out of the solution because they're not soluble so remember we said some salts are not soluble and so we'll talk about that more in 1412 but for right now we just want to remember that one of the exceptions to things being soluble is silver chloride or silver bromide or silver iodide they are not soluble and so if they bump into each other they'll hold on to each other and they'll drop out of the solution so what and down here in this line what's happening is that this is going to bump into this and it's going to precipitate out of the solution okay so this thing is going to wind up being one thing AGCL which you can see down here <clears throat> and to show that it precipitates out of the solution we can either write PPT for precipitate or we can write S which stands for solid uh, the other two things will remain in solution so let's make sure we understand the picture here we started off with a solution of NaCl and it's just a solution there's no precipitate so you've got water and you've got Na pluses floating around in the water and Cl minuses same thing here for the AgNO3 you've got NO3 minuses floating around in the water uh, and we've got Ag pluses floating around in the water and while I'm thinking about it this NO3 is covalent so it won't break up into N's and O's it just stays as NO3 people get that confused a lot so you would have a solution with water you'd have Ag pluses and NO3 minuses floating around so both of these if you just leave them alone they're fine they're both solutions but if you add them together now you've got four different things floating around in the water instead of just two on each one and so now out of those four things if these bump into these they don't remain soluble you understand what I'm saying so if an AG plus and a CL minus come together they actually don't stay soluble they stick together and drop out and that's shown down here with this AG plus plus CL minus thing here uh, so how would we be able to predict it well <clears throat> um, we'll learn about that in 1412 if you take it where we'll talk about things that are called solubility constants solubility products but for your purposes right now we're just going to give you a little chart to look at and uh, you'll want to try to remember as much of this as you can let's go to the next slide uh, so uh, I'll show you the chart in just a few moments so let's uh, do another example <clears throat> so it turns out that chromates here uh, if you have potassium chromate it'll be soluble so for example uh, if you put that in water you'll have K pluses and CRO42 minuses and it will be just a solution barium nitrate is also soluble so if you have a solution of barium nitrate you'll have water you'll have BA2 plus and you'll have NO3 minuses all floating around here and in fact that's actually shown um, they don't show it when it's in the two different solutions but they show after we add these things together um, so if you look here on the left hand side of this beaker it's got the K pluses here the bariums are here uh, the nitrates let's see are here and the chromates are here so when you first add these together that picture that I just marked that's going to be the way it's going to look they're going to all be floating around but what's going to happen is whenever one of the bariums hits one of the chromates so that would be one of these right here hits one of these right here the kind of like purple colored spheres they're going to stick together and drop out because barium chromate is not soluble uh, so that's going to be one of the rules we're going to learn chromates are only soluble if they're in conjunction with something 
from the first column of the chart or the first group of the chart, the alkali metals, and potassium happens to be one of those. So when it was with the potassium, it was okay. But once it <clears throat> bumps into the barium, <clears throat> because the barium's in the second column, it won't stay in solution. So we can see here that it's dropped out of the solution. So all the purple spheres will eventually bump into a chromate, <clears throat> assuming that there's the same number of each. Um, and they'll just fall down to the bottom. And this is what it actually looks like over here in, a, in real life. So this kind of like yellowish looking stuff at the bottom is a precipitate. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, just for our purposes, we're just going to say that if it's soluble, it means basically uh, it will dissolve. We'll get into much more precise definitions for solubility in 1412 in Chapter 17b. But soluble, basically, we're going to say it means it will dissolve. Insoluble, we're going to say it basically doesn't dissolve. <clears throat> However, that doesn't mean, as we'll see if you take 1412, it doesn't mean that there's zero solubility. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So here are the rules. Uh, and at some point, you're going to want to memorize all of these if, if you can. But just to let you know, these will be given to you on the final exam. So. It isn't absolutely essential that you memorize them. <clears throat> so what I do is I usually give you three, four, five, and six on my exams, and I ask you to remember one and two. So let's look at one and two. First of all, and they're very easy. Number one rule is that nitrates are always soluble. Nitrates are always soluble. NO3 minus is always soluble. Things in the first column, the alkali metals, first column or group, those are always soluble. So let's draw a line here because these two are kind of like separate from uh, the next ones. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> let's see how I can do this. I'm going to draw another line right here. So the things at the top in the first group, one and two rules, are always soluble. So just repeat that real quickly. Nitrates, NO3 minuses are always soluble. It doesn't matter what they bump into, they're not going to stick and drop out of the solution. <clears throat> and also, <clears throat> group uh, rule two, group 1A salts like uh, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, lithium will always be soluble. And also in, included in that is ammonium ion, NH4 plus is always soluble. Now, rules three and four here are things that are mostly soluble, but there are some exceptions. So like, for example, for rule three, Things in the seventh column, like chloride, bromide, and iodide, are uh, almost always soluble. So chlorides, bromides, and iodides are soluble with a few exceptions. So you would have to memorize these exceptions, silver, mercury, and lead. The way that I usually memorize those is I just think of them all being very heavy. So I just think, well, and, and it's not really uh, particularly accurate or scientific. It's just kind of like a mnemonic I use. Silver, mercury, and lead, if they bump into either of these things up above here, or any of these, uh, chlorides, bromides, or iodides, then they will precipitate. So um, basically, chlorides, bromides, and iodides are going to be soluble but there are these three exceptions. <clears throat> rule four is similar to rule three. Sulfates, SO42 minuses, are also usually soluble, <clears throat> again, with a few exceptions. Uh, so two of the exceptions for rule four are the same as the ones for rule three, mercury and lead here. So if a sulfate bumps into mercury or lead, it'll drop out and precipitate. And then also, we have two new things here. For sulfates, you have to add in barium and calcium. Both of those are in the second column. Uh, OK, when you get to rules 5 and 6, we're changing. And what we're saying for rules 5 and 6 is that these things in these two rules are usually not soluble. And again, there are some exceptions to that. Um, so, But the exceptions are in the other direction this time. In other words, the exceptions are going to be the things that are soluble. So be sure you keep this straight in your mind. Rules 5 and 6 are like the reverse of 3 and 4. So unless it's an exception for rules 5 and 6, it's not soluble. So let's look at 5. 
Five says that most hydroxides are going to be not soluble, uh, with some exceptions. And there are seven of these. Sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, and then cesium, lithium, and rubidium. Most of these are from the first columnar group, <clears throat> uh, and a couple of them are from the second column. Those things we're going to consider to be soluble. So if you see one of those seven, consider that is going to be soluble. So those are the exceptions. And then in rule six, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> those four things that are listed there, sulfides, carbonates, chromates, and phosphates, we're going to consider those to be not soluble. And the only exception would be if they're in conjunction with something from the first column, the alkali metals. OK, so here are your six rules. Uh, I would try to memorize these. Or if you can't memorize all of them, just try to re remember as much of it as you can, because it'll save you a ton of time. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so which of the following ions form compounds with lead that are generally soluble? And we can see immediately nitrate here. And we remember the rule, <clears throat> it was actually the first rule, that nitrates are always soluble. No matter what they bump into, they're still soluble. So that's going to be the answer. Let's just briefly look at these. Uh, generally soluble in water, lead uh, is one of the exceptions for chloride here. So it would make a precipitate. Sulfides have to be in uh, conjunction with something from the first column. And Pb2 plus is definitely not in the first column. Uh, it's all the way over, like on the other side of the transition metal. So that would precipitate. Sulfates are uh, usually soluble, but when they're uh, in conjunction with uh, certain things, they won't be soluble. And lead is one of those things. Remember, there were four for sulfate, <clears throat> mercury, lead, and then also calcium and barium. And then sodium. Uh, the reason that this isn't the right choice is because sodium and uh, lead 2 plus are not going to make a compound because they're both positively charged. Next slide. So next slide. Next slide. All right, now uh, moving on to the ways that we can write a chemical reaction or equation. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, there are three different ways we can write it. First of all, uh, write out the whole thing. So we call that the formula or the molecular equation. You just write out everything just the way it would be in your textbook. In fact, this is the way your textbook writes them. So the way the textbook writes it is called molecular or formula equation. So for example, I've just underlined at the bottom AgNO3 plus NaCl gives AgCl plus NaNO3. <clears throat> so what we have done is we've taken the Ag and moved it from the NO3 to the Cl and vice versa. So <clears throat> everything is written out and it's written out as if everything was acting as if it were a molecule. Okay, so that's how your book writes it. That's called the molecular equation. Now, but that isn't really the way it happens because what's going to happen is that this is actually not going to be AgNO3 in water. If you put it in water, it won't stay like that. It'll break up into Ag plus and NO3 minus. And the same thing for this and the same thing for this. So what we can do is we can write it the way it actually would be, and we call that the complete ionic equation. That, let's go to the next slide. And that would be where you just break up the AG and the NO3 and all this stuff. Everything except this. Now, this one actually is going to be written the way it was before, because that actually is the way it will be in the solution. It'll drop to the bottom, and it will be a precipitate. But everything else will be broken up. So all you have to do for the complete ionic equation is, first of all, identify your precipitate, if you have one, and leave it alone. And then everything else has to be broken up into its individual ions, so it's not hard at all. Uh, so just remember the second one here, and there's three of these, and usually that's how they'll ask it on a test, is they'll say, write the molecular, the complete ionic, and then the other one we're going to talk about in just a minute. Uh, so this is the second one, and all you have to do for this one is break up everything except any precipitates. And then the next slide. For the net ionic, so the one we just did was complete ionic. This one is net ionic. And for this one, all you do is you write what's actually reacting, which it doesn't actually look like this is a reaction, but it is. <clears throat> Ag plus plus Cl minus is giving you AgCl. And that is a precipitate. Uh, so the third one would be just part of it. So you leave a lot of stuff out for this one. Uh, so instead of writing all of that stuff with all the nitrates and all of that, you leave all of that out. All you want to write is 
uh, <clears throat> the things that are actually reacting. And the easiest way to see what that is is look at your precipitate and identify the two things that are in there, A, G, and C, L. So write on the left-hand side the A, G, and the C, L. All right, let's go to the next slide. And then the other things that we left out of that last reaction are called spectator ions, like, for example, the ones that we just did. The sodium doesn't get involved in the reaction at all, <clears throat> the sodium plus, uh, and the NO3 minus doesn't get involved in the reaction at all. So we call those spectator ions. Next slide. So write the correct formula equation or molecular equation, complete ionic and net ionic for the reaction between co cobalt chloride and sodium hydroxide. So what I would do if I were you, I mean, there's a couple of things we're going to have to do here. So it's not as easy as it might look. Uh, so we're going to have to figure out what the formulas are going to be for cobalt chloride and sodium hydroxide. The sodium hydroxide is easy. It's just NaOH. For the cobalt chloride, we have to figure out how many chlorides we're going to need for one cobalt. So remember, chloride is coming from the seventh column. It has a negative one charge, so we'll need two of them because the cobalt they're telling us is plus two. So it would be COCl2. So anyway, but that's the first thing you'll have to do for these problems. You'll have to figure out, first of all, what are the formulas for the things that are reacting? And then you'll have to figure out what's happening on the other side. And then you'll have to balance it. And that's just to get started. But then once you get it to that point, you're well on your way to finishing. So first of all, let's just figure out what we're going to be reacting. So we're, we're told that we're going to have a reaction between cobalt to chloride and sodium hydroxide. So I mean, we'll see this on the next slide, but you're just going to write COCl2 because that's the correct way to write cobalt chloride, cobalt to chloride and then plus NaOH, and then draw your arrow, uh, which in this case, just draw an arrow. And when you're writing the cobalt chloride and the sodium hydroxide, you want to leave a space before them in case you have to write a number in there. And then after the arrow, you're going to switch the things on the right. So instead of having cobalt chloride, you'll have cobalt hydroxide uh, on the product side of the arrow. And then you'll have sodium chloride. So uh, you want to write out those properly, so sodium chloride is going to be NaCl. Now, notice here that we're not worried about balancing the equation yet. We're just um, writing these out in terms of the correct way to write the formulas. We'll worry later about balancing this. <clears throat> so you would write out NaCl, uh, and then you would write out whatever you're going to get for cobalt hydroxide. So let's think about that for a minute. Hydroxides minus one, cobalt's plus two, so we've got to have two hydroxides to match the cobalt 2 because it's plus 2. So it would be CO and then open parentheses OH, close parentheses and subscript 2. And so that would finish out our reaction other than just to balance it. And now before we go to the next slide, one other thing we need to think about is, is any of this stuff going to precipitate? Because if it does, then that means and undoubtedly there will be something. Uh, then it's going to give us the ability to write the second and third forms of our reaction. So one of the things we're going to wind up with sodium is sodium chloride, and that's clearly soluble. It's not going to precipitate, right? Because sodium is always soluble because <clears throat> it's in the first column. Co what about cobalt hydroxide? Well, hydroxides are usually uh, not soluble unless that's one of the seven things that we mentioned, which was sodium hydroxide, potassium, and there's all kinds of other ones. So, um, but cobalt is not one of those. And I mean, one way you can tell that quickly is to realize that cobalt is not in the first or second column. So, I mean, it doesn't mean that everything in the first and second column are soluble when they're hydroxides. It just means that if they're not, you know for sure that it's not soluble. So that's going to make a precipitate. So when this cobalt bumps into this hydroxide, it's going to precipitate out and make a precipitate down at the bottom. So we're going to denote that in our reaction by writing S or PPT next to that. And then that's going to give us the basis to finish it. Let's go to the next slide. So when we write this out, start off by writing COCl2 plus NaOH on the left, COOH2 plus NaCl on the right. And notice that I put an S here to that uh, so that that lets me know that I've got a precipitate right there. So that thing that I just marked is going to be in all three of these. <clears throat> now, to balance it, what we're going to have to do is put in a 2 here. 
and a two here, and we're balanced. Okay. Now, to go to the complete ionic equation, everything except what I'm circling right now is going to have to be broken up. So this becomes Na plus and CO minus. This becomes Na plus and OH minus. This becomes CO2 plus and two Cl minuses. So I just wrote all of that here. So it's it took me two lines to do it. Uh, so here is everything broken up except the COOH2, which I left because it doesn't break up because it's a precipitate. And then the last one, so that's the complete ionic equation. And then the last one, the net ionic equation, you just locate the thing that precipitated, which is the COOH2, and then find the things on the left-hand side of the arrow that would uh, go together to make that, which is going to be the thing I'm circling right now and then the two OHs and everything else we're going to leave out. So just write CO2 plus plus two OH minus gives COOH2 and that is going to be your net ionic equation. So you can see these are not really very difficult. So actually what would you say the hardest part was? I mean I would say it was figuring out how to write these different molecular formulas here at the top uh, and then maybe to some extent balancing it. Next slide. All right, so here we go. Uh, so we have 0.01 liters, which I'm just converting that, of a 0.3 molar sodium phosphate reacts with 0.02 liters of 0.2 molar lead nitrate. What precipitate will form? What mass will form? I had to sit down. So what we'll have to do is the same thing we just did. We'll have to figure out what is the formula for this, what is the formula for this, and then what are the products going to be. So let's do that. See if we can figure out the precipitate. Let's do all this before we even flip the slide. So phosphate's PO43 minus sodium's plus one. We'll need three sodiums. So uh, Na3PO4 plus, and then lead nitrate. Nitrate's minus one, lead's plus two. So we'll have Pb. NO2 in parentheses, two, uh, sorry, NO3 in parentheses, 2. So those are the two reactants. And then draw an arrow. It's not balanced yet, but we'll get to that. Um, and then <clears throat> on the other side, you switch lead over to phosphate, and you switch sodium over to nitrate. So sodium nitrate, that's just NaNO3 because it's plus 1 and minus 1. For the lead phosphate, uh, you've got a plus 2 for the lead and minus 3 for the phosphate. So you're going to wind up with PB3PO4-2. And that's going to be on the product side. So if you didn't catch that, you may want to rewind this and play it a couple of more times till you get what I just did. Um, and then the next step would be to balance it and also to figure out, which I'm not going to do that because I can't really do that in my head. Um, <clears throat> But we can go ahead and figure out if we're going to have a precipitate. And evidently we will because it's asking us what precipitate will form. So sodium, if it goes with nitrate, that's not going to make a precipitate. Because both sodium and nitrate are always soluble. So it has to be the lead sulfate. So uh, lead, uh, so it's PB3PO42 is going to be our precipitate. What mass will form, we'll get to in just a minute. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and I put the rules again here in case you need to look at them. Next slide. <clears throat> so here at this point right here that I'm underlining right now, that is going to be what we start off with. That's where we just write out the molecules correctly. <clears throat> so figure out what the correct molecule would be. For example, Na and PO4, it's got to be Na3PO4 because the PO4 is 3 minus and Na is uh, 1 plus. So you have to have three of the Na's. So do the thing, same thing for all of those. <clears throat> and then also notice that we marked the lead. So it's PB3PO42, which we marked S because it's going to be a precipitate. And the next step is to balance it. So I'm not going to go through balancing here. But when we do it, <clears throat> we get a 2 here, a 3 here, and a 6 here. Okay, And so basically now we have a balanced molecular equation. And we're not going to do the other stuff where we do the complete ionic and uh, net ionic here because the problem isn't asking us to do that. We're going to do something else. 
All right, now the next thing we're going to have to do is figure out which one of these two reactants. So this is a reactant, and this is a reactant, right? Because they're both on the left-hand side of the arrow here. Uh, we have to figure out which one of those is going to run out first, or in other words, we have to figure out which one is going to be the limiting reactant. Now, this is a solution, but we do it the same way we would <clears throat> if we were doing it with solids. We first of all have to figure out uh, which one is going to run out first, so let's do that. So, for the thing on the left, the sodium phosphate, we were told that we had 10 milliliters, which I changed to 0.01 liters. I just moved the decimal back three places to the left. And I wanted to get it in liters, so when I multiply by moles per liter, I get moles. And then we were also told that it's 0.3 moles per liter. So if I multiply 0.3 moles per liter times 0.01 liters, I get 0.003 moles of this stuff on the left, the sodium phosphate, right? You with me so far? So uh, then do the same thing for the lead nitrate. So for the lead nitrate, we had 20 milliliters and it was uh, given as 0.2 moles per liter. So multiply these together and you get 0.004. Now, if you just look at these, it looks like the sodium phosphate is going to run out first because you don't have as much, but that's not how you do it. You have to look at your coefficients. I mean, unless they're both one. So that's called stoichiometry. You want to look at the relationship between the two and the three. And again, you can do this either way. You're going to get the same answer regardless of whether you start with the sodium phosphate or the lead nitrate. Let's say you start with the sodium phosphate. Then how much of it do you have? You have 0.003 moles. You would have to have three halves because for every two of these sodium phosphates, you're going to have to have three of the lead nitrates. You would have to have three halves as much of the lead nitrate in order for there to be enough lead nitrate to react with all the sodium phosphate. So multiply 3 halves times 0.003 and you get 0 0.0045. 0 0.0045 is how much of this stuff right here you'd have to have to react with all of the sodium phosphate. So look and see how much of it do you have. Well, you have 0 0.004. Is that enough? No, you need to have 0 0.0045. So you don't have enough of this stuff here at the bottom, this, this stuff. You don't have enough of it. You need 0 0.0045. You don't have that much. You only have 0 0.0040. So this one's going to run out first. So this is going to be your limiting reactant. So we're going to use this to do all the calculations for figuring out how much product, for example, we can make. Um, all right. So I think the first question, they're, there's three questions here. And I think the first one is going to be, they're going to ask us how much of this stuff right here we can make. So let's go ahead and just do that part now. In fact, I usually just go ahead and leave it right here on the slide and do all three parts. Um, I don't know if I'll do that this time or not. So uh, this is our limiting reactant. So we want to use this one to do uh, the calculations to see how much of the other stuff we can make. So um, let's just go ahead and figure out how much of the lead phosphate we can make. So for every three moles of the lead nitrate that we start with over here on the left, we can only make one uh, lead phosphate. So we can only make a third as many moles of lead phosphate as we have of the lead nitrate. So how many moles do we have of the lead nitrate? We have 0 0.004 moles of it. So we can make 0 0.004 divided by three moles of the lead phosphate. <coughs> So just divide 0 0.0040 by 3, and you get 0 0.001333 moles of the lead phosphate that you can make. So the first question is asking you, how many grams can you make of the lead phosphate? So what you would do is you would say, OK, we can make 0 0.001333 moles of it. So multiply the 0 0.001333 moles times the mass per mole. And to do that, you'd have to look up lead in the chart, get its mass, look up phosphorus, get its mass. You're going to have two of the phosphoruses because of the two here. And then multiply 8 times 16 for O, add it all together, and that'll give you your mass. So that takes care of part A. Uh, for part B, they're going to ask us how much nitrate we can make. So just do it the same way. Uh, we know that we have 0 0.004 moles of the lead nitrate for every three of these here we can make six of these so we can make twice as much so if we have 0 0.004 moles of the lead nitrate we can make 0 0.008 
which is just 2 times 0 .004, 0 0.008 moles of the sodium nitrate. And the sodium nitrate breaks up into 1NA and 1NO3, so the number of moles is going to be the same for both those. It's going to be 0 0.008. So you can make 0 0.008 moles. But they want the concentration, and this is on the, some of the following slides. Uh, but they're going to ask us for the concentration, not the number of moles. So yeah, we have 0 0.008 moles, but what's the total volume? So we have to remember that we started off with 0 0.01 liters of uh, the sodium phosphate, and we started with 0 0.02 liters of the lead nitrate. But when we add them together, we have not 0 0.01 or 0 0.02. We have 0 0.03 total, because we have to add 0 0.01 to 0 0.02. So we would have to divide the 0 0.008 moles here that we have of the nitrate divided by 0 0.03 liters. So 0 0.008 moles divided by 0 0.03 liters will give us the molarity of the nitrate. And then I'm trying to decide if I want to go ahead and just do this now. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the best thing to do. Uh, but let's try it. And then if I can't finish it without actually going to the actual slide, I'll, I'll go ahead and move on. The last thing they're going to ask us to do is figure out how much of the phosphate over here is going to be left over. And what they mean by that is that we're not going to react all of that. When we do this reaction, we're going to have some sodium phosphate left over, and they want to know how much phosphate is going to be left over. So to do that, what we have to do is we have to say, OK, we have 0 0.004 moles of this stuff right here, and we can only react 2 thirds as much of the sodium phosphate as we have number of moles of lead nitrate for the reasons that we mentioned before. So if we've got 0 0.004 moles of the lead nitrate, we multiply that by 2 over 3. And that'll tell us how many moles of the sodium phosphate will react. So it turns out if you multiply 2 thirds times 0 0.004, you get something like 0 0.0027. 0 0.0027, and just take my word for it. So you would react 0 0.0027 moles of the lead nitrate. I'm sorry, not the lead nitrate. The, you would react 0 0.0027 moles of the sodium phosphate. But you started with 0 0.003 moles of the sodium phosphate. So how much would be left over after you reacted 0 0.0027 moles of it? Well, it would be 0 0.0030 minus 0 0.0027, which would be 0 0.0003 moles of the sodium phosphate that would be left over, and that's an approximate number. Uh, and then again, they want us to give them the concentration. So, I mean, what we just did up to this point is really the, the whole uh, hard part of the problem, but to get the final answer, we have to divide by the total volume. But that's just going to be the same as we had for part B. It's going to be uh, 0.01 liters plus 0.02 liters here. Uh, so the total would be 0 0.03 liters. <clears throat> so you're going to divide 0 0.0003 moles by 0 0.03 liters to get the molarity for the phosphate. And again, notice here for every one of the Na3PO4s, you're going to have one of the phosphates, so it's going to match one to one. All right, so the next four or five slides, or three or four slides, are going to be doing what we just did. And we just did it all like without even having to change the slide. So let's go ahead and move to the next slides. So here, um, let's see, I'm just giving you kind of an introduction. Uh, so you can pause here if you want. Next slide. And here's where we figured out how much product we could make, 0 0.001333 moles. And then we multiplied it by the molar mass of the lead phosphate, which turned out to be a gigantic number here. Wow. Uh, and then let's go to the next slide. And we did part two. Next slide. Next. So here's your answer if you want to pause here. Um, so uh, you can pause this and look at this and get more of the detail. Uh, next slide. And then here's part three. So I'm reading from the top here. This is part three where we figured out how much of the phosphates left over and found the concentration. Next slide. Um, and so here's where I multiplied by the 2 over 3. And I got, I said 0 0.003, and I said that was approximate. So it's actually 0 0.0268. Um, 
Oh, no, it is 0 0.003. Sorry, it is 0 0.003. 0 0.0032, okay. And then you divide that by 0 0.03, which is on the next slide, evidently. Yeah, so down here at the bottom, 0 0.0003 divided by 0 0.03 gives 0 0.011 molar. So, again, you can pause these. The reasoning is on the slides as well as what I said back previously on that first slide. So you can listen to what I said in the first slide, and then you can read it again here. Uh, anyway, let's go into the next slide. Acid-base reactions, we're going to talk about very briefly, but it's basically where you have like uh, hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide. The rule is acid plus base gives us salt plus water, where the water is actually the product of your reaction. So it's H plus plus OH minus gives H2O. Next slide. So uh, our first definition here where uh, we're just kind of introducing acids and bases is that an acid is something that's a proton donor. A proton is just a proton. Or you can also actually think of H plus as being a proton because H plus is a hydrogen without its electron, but a hydrogen is just a proton. So you can either call it H plus or you can call it a proton. Actually, if you call it H plus, that's a different uh, theory called Arrhenius theory, but it's the same thing. Okay, and the difference between the Arrhenius and the Bronsted Lowry. Bronsted Lowry just calls a base something that accepts a proton rather than to calling it rather than to call it OH minus. That's Arrhenius's theory. So we're going to use Bronsted Lowry. We're just going to say an acid's a proton donor and a base is a proton acceptor. So whenever you've got an acid and a base, you have H plus plus OH minus from the base gives H2O. The OH minus here is a proton acceptor. And when it accepts that proton, you have water. Acid plus base gives salt plus water. Next slide. When you do acid-base reactions, a lot of the time you do what are called titrations. A titration is where you take one of those things that we looked at at the very beginning of the class called a burette, which has the numbers going upside down in the wrong direction, and you put usually the base in the uh, burette, and you fill it up to a certain level where you know exactly how much of the base you have. You put your acid along with an indicator in a uh, beaker and drip the base into the acid until your indicator changes color. Uh, when the indicator changes color, that's called the endpoint. And you'll want to try to keep this straight. The endpoint is when the indicator changes color, like phenolphthalein will turn very light pink. So the equivalence point is where you have exactly the same number of moles of acid and base. And so the, what they try to do is they try to uh, rig these up so that the endpoint and the equivalence point will be exactly the same, but they're not. Uh, you can't get them so they're exactly the same, but they're close enough that we can get very good results. <clears throat> so um, when we're doing all of this, it's called a titration. Let's go to the next slide. So for example, if we have a titration of nitric acid with sodium hydroxide, nitric acid is a strong acid, sodium hydroxide is a strong base. How many moles of sodium hydroxide would we need? So we're starting with one liter of nitric acid and it's 0.5 moles per liter. So multiply one liter times 0.5 moles per liter and you're gonna have 0.5 moles where the liters are gonna cancel of nitric acid. So how many moles would you need of sodium hydroxide? You would need the same, right? Because it's a one to one ratio because you're gonna have in HNO3 plus NaOH gives water plus NaCl. So it's one to one to one to one. So if you've got 0 0.5 moles of the acid, you'll have to have 0 0.5 moles of the base to completely neutralize it. Next slide. <clears throat> so one liter times 0.5 moles per liter gives you 0 0.5 moles of the acid. So we'll need 0 0.5 moles of the base. And that would be what would give it would be required to give us the equivalence point. So the answer is going to be 0 0.5 moles of sodium hydroxide, which is the base, which is the proton acceptor. Next slide. Here are some of the strong and weak acids and strong bases and weak bases. So you'll notice Let's do the bases first. They all end in hydroxide. So all of the strong bases are hydroxides. 
and there are actually a few more that we've mentioned before. So it's sodium, potassium, barium, calcium, cesium, rubidium, and lithium. Weak bases would be things like ammonia, NH3. In fact, that's the one that we're going to use the most. There are other ones like formate and acetate. Uh, strong acids, there are actually seven of them, of which we see one, two, three, four, five here. There are two other ones. So hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, <clears throat> nitric, sulfuric, chloric, and perchloric are the seven strong acids, which at some point, if you stay in chemistry, you'll need to memorize those for various reasons, which will become obvious later. Weak acids are going to be things like acetic acid, uh, hydrofluoric acid, HF, and phosphoric acid. So if I were you right now, I would just memorize that sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid are strong acids. Eventually, you want to get to the point where you know all seven of them. And then for right now, just start off and say, okay, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide are strong bases. If you want to throw these two in, also you can. There are three other ones, and I'll just tell you what they are in case you're interested. Lithium hydroxide, cesium hydroxide, and rubidium hydroxide are also strong bases. Next slide. And then remember we said at the beginning of all of this that there were precipitation reactions, acid-base reactions, and redox reactions or oxidation reduction reactions. So now we're on our last one, redox reactions. So before I flip this, um, I'm going to just tell you that uh, what they're going to do is they're going to show you how to balance a redox reaction using a very intuitive technique that isn't maybe the best technique out there. In fact, it isn't. But uh, in order to teach you the harder but the more accurate technique, you have to have a little more background in chemistry. So we do that in Chemistry 1412. So uh, I have that as an appendix in your lecture notes that are on Canvas. So if you want to go to your lecture notes for Chapter 4, at the end of them, there's a supplement there that has how to do this the long way, which is more accurate. So let's look at the way they do it here. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so oxidation reaction react, oxidation reduction reactions are reactions in which one or more electrons are transferred. You'll want to remember this. One or more electrons are transferred. That makes these different from all the other kind of reactions. You have electrons that are going from one thing to another. Okay, understand? So next slide. So an example of that is what we've talked about before. If you have elemental sodium, which I, I've told you before, it looks like a loaf of bread. And if you have elemental chlorine, which is chlorine gas, which is this kind of amber looking uh, gas, if you react them, remember that when you have a metal and a non-metal, what's going to happen? Well, a metal is going to give up an electron, basically, and the non-metal is going to accept it. So that's a redox reaction by definition, right? We didn't say it at the time we uh, introduced ionic reactions, but it is a redox reaction. It's oxidation reduction. The shorthand way of saying that is redox. It means you have a transfer of electrons. In this case, the electrons going from the sodium, uh, the element sodium, which is neutral, to the uh, chlorine. <clears throat> and that makes the chlorine become chlorine minus, and the sodium becomes Na plus. OK. So, once that happens, as we already know, it's going to make a lattice. Uh, all right, so let's move to the next slide. So, a few rules we need to know here. Uh, whenever you've got sodium as an element or chlorine as an element, you just say their oxidation state is zero. So, if you have copper wire, for example, you'd say the oxidation state of that is zero. Um, I'll let you look at uh, rule two there on your own. For oxygen, since oxygen's in the sixth column, and uh, so that means it has six valence electrons, but it doesn't want six, it wants eight because of the octet rule. Uh, oxygen is a main group element, so it wants eight electrons in its outer shell. So if it takes two more, uh, which it typically will do in reactions, uh, to get to eight, then its charge will be minus two because it has two more electrons than it has protons. So we call that oxygen's oxidation state. Hydrogen typically will give up, I mean, not always, but most of the time, will give up an electron being in the first column. 
And if it does give up an electron, actually, there are a lot of times when it doesn't do this, but let's just worry about this one. Uh, if it did do that, then it would have a plus one charge. So we say its oxidation state is plus one. All right, come down to rule five here. Fluorine is in the seventh column, so that means it has seven valence electrons. It wants eight. If it takes one more to get eight, it will have one too many electrons, so it will be negative one. Okay, rule six says that if you have a neutral compound, like for example, sodium chloride, then the oxidation states of the cation and the anion have to add up to zero. So, and they do, right? So think about it. Sodium chloride, you've got Na plus and you've got Cl minus. So one plus and one minus equals zero, <clears throat> which is what is required here. But if you have an ion, like for example, remember some of the things we memorized earlier, like sulfate was SO4 with a two minus charge. Then what that means is if you add the oxidation states up for the S and the four O's, you have to come up with a total of negative two. Okay, let's go ahead and go on to the next slide here. So let's do these together. Uh, the way that we're going to do these, we're going to be trying to find all of the oxidation states for all of these, but we already know uh, some of them. <clears throat> for, <clears throat> excuse me, for example, for the O's, we know, or we're going to assume that they're negative two. Now, sometimes O can be negative one, but not here, so we're not going to worry about that right now. So for all of these that have O in them here, so that's going to be the first three of these, just assume that it's negative two. And also for the K there in that first choice, just assume that it's plus one because it's in the first column. Uh, let's see what else. For the uh, last one, for the F, you're going to assume that it's negative one because it's in the seventh column. Same thing for the CL here. All right, so let me just review what we're going to assume that we already know. For the first one, we're going to assume that we already know that the K is plus one. The O is minus two. For the second one, we're going to assume that we know that the O is minus 2. For the third one, the O is minus 2. For the fourth one, the CL is minus 1. And for the fifth one, F is minus 1. So that means everything I didn't just mention, we're trying to figure out. Here's how you do it. <clears throat> for the first one up here, A, uh, K2Cr2O7. If O is minus 2 and there are 7 O's, then multiply 7 times minus 2, and that's minus 14. So to start off with, you have a minus 14, and that has to be matched with a plus 14 on the left-hand side. But the Ks are plus one, and there's two of those, so that's plus two. So that means that that gets rid of two of the plus 14s, and that leaves 12 of the plus 14s. So in other words, plus 12 that has to be supplied by the chromiums. So if there were just one chromium here, it would have to be plus 12. But there are not only one, there are two. So because there are two that have to equal plus 12, each of these chromiums here has to be plus six. So the chromiums are gonna be plus six. And that's actually the hardest one because the rest of these are more straightforward. Uh, come down to the CO3 two minus. Okay, we said O is minus two. <clears throat> there are t three of them. So three times minus two is minus six. So if you stopped right there, you'd say, oh, then carbon has to be plus six. But you don't stop there because we have to leave two of those six minus charges here because they have to make up the charge on the ion. So instead of using minus six, we have to leave two of the minus sixes there. So that leaves four minus charges that the carbon has to match. So that means the carbon has to be plus four. And since there's only one carbon, then that one carbon has to be plus four. Uh, go on down now to the next one, MnO2. We do the same way we just did this one. Uh, o, we consider to be minus two. There's two of them, so that would be two times minus two. What's that? Minus four, right? So the Mn has to be what? plus four. For D, PCL5, the CLs are minus one, but we have five of them. So minus one times five is minus five, so the P has to be what? Uh, and I'll let you answer that. And then the same thing for E, so I'll let you answer that. Let's go on to the next slide. 
and here are the answers. So see if you got them right. Next slide. So redox, uh, oxidation reduction, a couple of very simple definitions here also. Uh, oxidation is the loss of electrons, reduction is the gain of electrons. And the way I've always remembered that from the first time I went through undergrad is that when you hear the word reduction, you would think immediately, okay, that's the loss of electrons, but it isn't, it's the opposite. So I just remember that, that reduction is what I would expect would be the loss of electrons, but it isn't. Uh, it's the gain of electrons. So reduction is the gain of electrons. And that's how I remember it. Because once I remember what the definition for reduction is, <clears throat> then I automatically know that oxidation has to be the loss of electrons. So you'll want to remember these two. You don't have to do it the way I just said it. You can do it any way you want. But remember, oxidation is losing and reduction is gaining. Next slide. All right, so uh, let's look at A, B, and C here and see if they're oxidation reduction. So here, zinc, we can see it's oxidation reduction because here, zinc is zero. And the reason I'm saying that is because it's an element. And one of the rules that we looked at was that whenever you've got an element, you consider the oxidation number to be zero. So if you have zinc solid, all of the zinc atoms are going to be zero, and that's the only way it could work. Any other way you do it, if you say they're all going to be negative one, then you're going to have like a huge charge on a piece of zinc that has like, you know, 10 to the 23rd atoms, you'd have a charge at 10 to the 23rd uh, negative charges, which would like, you know, that's a gigantic amount of charge. I mean, that's like 100,000 coulombs of charge and that just couldn't happen. So the only way it can work for an element is it has to, all, they have to all be zero. And then here the seal is minus one and the H is plus one. Now on the right hand side, the zinc has gone from zero to plus two and it has to be plus two because these are minus one still. There's two of them, so it's minus two for the chlorides, um, but uh, that means that the zinc has to be plus two. But over here, the zinc was zero. So what happened? Well, the zinc lost two electrons and it went from zero to plus two. So loss of electrons, that is what? oxidation so the zinc was oxidized so something had to be reduced and it turns out that that was the H plus because the H plus is going from plus one to zero here and again the reason I'm saying that it's zero here is because it's an element now I know it says H2 but that's the way gases <clears throat> for certain things gases will exist that way as diatomic molecules and H happens to be one of those things. So you don't see H floating around by itself. It's more stable if it makes H2 because it has a duet. But even though it's H2, it's still zero. Both of the H's and the H2 are considered to be zero. So this one is a redox reaction, and we just talked about the states. Now, uh, let's go on to C, and we'll come back to B at the end. Here, we've got copper, and it's uh, going to be plus one. Let me just write one here. And then it's breaking up into two things. Here it's zero because it's an element. And here it's plus two. The copper is plus two because it's with two chlorides. And the chlorides are not going to change here. So this chloride is minus one. And these two chlorides over here on the right are minus one also. So what's changing the copper is changing, right? So the copper starts off at one on the left. And on the right, it turns into two things. Part of it turns into plus two. So that means that it's going from plus one to plus two. So it's losing electrons. So it's being oxidized. And the other part of it is going from one to zero. So that means it's gaining electrons. So it's being reduced. So this part is being oxidized and this part is being reduced. That part right there. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time. So this one is redox. Uh, B I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it is not a redox reaction. And that's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Because if you go through and mainly what you're looking at here, if you want to do it on your own, look at the chromium. Chromium here is going to be plus six. And if you look over here, this chromium is plus six also. And then the O's and the H's don't change. So it's not redox. Let's go to the next slide here. Uh, okay, so this slide, if you want to pause here, you can. This slide and the next two slides are the answers to what we just did. So let's go to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Get to the next problem, and the next one. So uh, I'm, I'm going to skip this also. So next slide. 
All right, so uh, balance a reaction between solid zinc and aqueous HCl to produce zinc chloride and H gas. Next slide. Uh, next slide. All right, so what we do is we write down what they said in the problem statement. Zinc plus HCl gives zinc 2 plus plus Cl plus H2. All right, and the reason they're writing it unbalanced is because what we're going to do is balance but we don't just balance it the way we have been doing. We have to do it differently because we're also dealing here. In addition to trying to get the same number of zincs on both sides and so forth, but we're also going to have to balance the charges and that makes it harder. Like for example, if you look here, the way this is right now, it's not balanced. Well, is it balanced in terms of the elements? No, because you've got two H's on the right and one on the left. But in addition to that, you've got zero charge on the left and you've got two plus and a minus on the right. So you can just balance this one actually it turns out the same way we've been doing it because all you have to do is put a two in front of the HCl on the left and that means you now have two Cl so you have to put a two in front of the Cl on the right and you're finished. And that actually turns out to balance not only the elements but it just so happens in this case that it also would balance the charges. But it but it won't always be that way. So what we're trying to do is learn a way where we can do it systematically. And the way we're going to do is we're going to look at the charges also. So how many electrons are being lost right here? You're going from zinc, and this is zero, right, because it's a solid, to two plus. So you're losing two electrons here. I'm just going to write two. And also over here, the H thing here is going to zero over here. But what is it on? The, so over here, again, it's zero, right? But what is it over here? It's plus one, which I'm going to make it quicker by just doing plus. Uh, and the CL is minus one. Well, the CL is the same on both sides, so we won't worry about that. So uh, H is, let's see, gaining an electron, so it's being reduced. Let me just write R here. So the H plus is gaining an electron to become zero. And if you don't understand that, you'll want to pause here and think about that for a minute, contemplate that. The H plus is going to H zero, so it had to gain an electron, and that's reduction. But it has to happen two times. So there are actually two electrons over here that are being gained, so that means we have to have this happening twice. And we already said that the zinc lost two electrons when it went from zinc zero to zinc two plus. So that means that this has to happen two times, so you put it two here. Now we have two electrons being uh, lost or gain, as I see, two electrons being gained here, and that allows us to have H2 here uh, that both become zeros. Uh, and then for the zincs, uh, because the zinc is losing two electrons here in one fell swoop, you don't have to do anything to that. And then the way they want you to do it in this class is they want you to say, okay, but now uh, we still have an element that even though it isn't involved in the exchange of electrons, it still needs to be balanced, and that's the chlorine. So the chlorine is going from minus one to minus one, so it isn't changing its oxidation state. But nevertheless, we have two chlorines now on the left and only one on the right, so we finish by putting a two here. All right, let's go to the next slide, and that's just the answer. Here, uh, next slide. Next. 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 Okay, so I'm just kind of flipping through these because we've already talked about this. Uh, so while we finish this up and wait for all this stuff to appear, um, I'm going to just uh, remind you that if you want to look at the long, more systematic way to do this, you can go to your lecture notes for Chapter 4 in Canvas. Now, those are in a separate compartment in your assignments. Uh, so you've got one uh, place where, they've, where, where I have videos, and you have another place where I have the lecture notes and the work problems. So what I'm talking about is if you go to Chapter 4's lecture notes, it's a PDF. Uh, you can look at that at the very end, and it will tell you how to do this the long way. Okay, so here we are. Here's our final 
solution to this. Okay, and then next slide is the end. Okay. All right, so that wraps up Chapter 4's lecture notes, so I'll see you in the work problems.